listening to Ohio V, the world, an Ohio history podcast. The only podcast dedicated exclusively to the history of the Buckeye State. Subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and review us. Join the conversation now at Facebook. Stream and donate to the show at OhioVTheWorldPodcast.com. Now, here's your host, Alex Hasty. It's hard to tell. Hey guys, welcome to the second episode of Ohio vs. the World, an Ohio history podcast. Today we're looking at Ohio versus the Electoral College. There's an old saying, so goes Ohio, so goes the nation. Ohio has an amazing track record of correctly choosing the president. We're going to look at that record over the last 31 uh, elections with Kyle Kondik. He's an author, a political analyst with the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Kyle published a book in 2016 entitled The Bellwether, Why Ohio Picks the President. So it's a great book. I encourage everyone to go pick a copy up. Um, and Kyle's going to sit down with us and talk about some of the interesting presidential elections in the Buckeye State and why we seem to always get it right. Uh, this episode's uh, Ohio vs. the World Beer of the Month. Uh, we pick an Ohio beer to enjoy while we record the show every time. Uh, it's 17th State Pale Ale from our friends Curtis and Chris up in Cleveland. Um, it's, a, it's a great looking can. It's a great Ohio beer. Uh, the last one I enjoyed was in the freezing cold a couple weeks ago at First Energy Stadium watching the Browns go to 0-13 against the Cincinnati Bengals in the Battle of Ohio. Uh, great beer. Uh, horrible football team. But a couple of my friends uh, from college, Chris and Curtis, put that together. Um, they're doing great. So check that out in, up, up in uh, Northeast Ohio. 17statebrewco.com. 17thstatebrewco.com. Uh, they've got a great t-shirt on the website, too, that says, So Goes the 17th State, So Goes the Nation. So Ohio loves a winner, okay? Well, we also love football, but we also love picking a winner. And, and so Urban Meyer, who's Ohio State's football coach, he's 23-3 and in his last two seasons here at Ohio State. And he's considered a deity across the state. But, but you know who's better? Us. Our parents, our grandparents, our aunts, our cousins. Us. Ohioans. We're 29-2, and two, correctly picking the president in the last 120 years. 29-2 and two in the last 31 national elections. We've picked the president correctly every year since 1960. We were only wrong one other time in that time span, the last 31 elections. And that was by a percentage point in 1944. We'll talk about the reasons why Ohio was, was wrong in 44, But two times since 1896. It's said that Ohio is a microcosm for the nation. How can a Midwestern state stay an example for a country that's changed so much demographically and regionally over the last 120 years? That 29-2 and record I keep talking about of picking the commander-in-chief from 1896 when Canton, Ohio's own William McKinley beat William Jennings Bryan. That's a great election, and we'll talk about that in a later episode. But think about how much has changed since 1896, people. Radios invented television. The massive migration to the, to the South and the West, the influx of European and Asian and Latin immigrants. Two world wars. I, I don't know. The automobile was invented. Everything is different since 1896, but Ohio is still a bellwether state. And this record, this national elections record, it started 16 years before Arizona was even a state. Arizona, our, our 48th state, uh, enters the Union in 1912. Why has Ohio gotten it right? Our closest, most historic national elections. Are Ohioans from the future? Author Kyle Kondik will join us. We'll talk to us today about the 1948 election, Truman versus Dewey. We'll talk about 1976, President Ford versus Jimmy Carter. And the more recent 2004, George W. Bush versus John Kerry election. And we'll ask Kyle, why is Ohio so emblematic of our country? Will the 17th state, will the Buckeye state continue to be a bellwether for national elections as the United States and the world continue to change? So let's get after it. We've got a great young author, a political analyst, and fellow Ohioan, Kyle Kondik. He's an OU grad, Ohio University. Uh, we'll look at his book, The Bellwether, because so goes Ohio, so goes the nation.
we're sitting here with Kyle Condick uh, from the University of Virginia Center for Politics. And Kyle wrote a fantastic book called The Bellwether, uh, Why Ohio Picks the President. Uh, it's an Ohio University Press book from 2016. Um, I suggest everybody go out and get it again, The Bellwether, Why Ohio Picks the President. Um, Kyle, just a couple of things. Why is Ohio uh, a bellwether to you and not a swing state? And, and, and also, what is a bellwether? So a bellwether, uh, I think most people know the, the term bellwether, which is sort of a leading indicator or a trend, but uh, the sort of archaic definition of what a bellwether is is that a bellwether is a generally castrated sheep uh, that has a bell around its neck, and it leads the flock. So uh, if you're trying to figure out where the flock is, uh, you hear the bell, you know where the bellwether is who's leading leading the flock. And so it's this term that's often used to describe states that, you know, uh, vote for winners in presidential elections or otherwise predictive of, of trends. Uh, uh, there, the term swing state, I think, is more common than bellwether today. Uh, and I try to define the two terms slightly similar, d differently in the book. Uh, bellwether is a state that votes close to the national average regardless. So if, uh, if you know, Canada wins by 20 points nationally, you'd expect that state to also you know, provide a 20-point roughly margin of that candidate. Or if, it, you know, if it's a one-point race, you'd expect the state to be a one-point race too. Uh, swing state is just a state that is close in any given election. So sometimes there is a, a state that's a swing state that is decided by one or two points in an election that's not that close nationally. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a, uh, of a distinction there. But, uh, the, you know, I, I would say that just in terms of how they're used in the media now, I'd say swing state is often just thrown out as, uh, you know, describing the handful of states that are typically competitive in a presidential election. Uh, uh, veterans of the revolutionary of the Revolutionary War from Virginia, uh, and so there's the southern character to that part uh, of the state. The middle part of the state was settled by a lot of people from the Mid Atlantic, including states like Pennsylvania and Maryland, uh, etc. And so, uh, some have said that Ohio is uh, well, it was the 17th state to enter the Union. It's actually the first quote American state because sure. it's a it's a collection of pieces from the country um, from when, from its from its founding and from the original 13 states. And really, the state sort of stayed this kind of microcosm of the nation for a very long time, uh, and I think that's reflected in our voting patterns. Ohio is, uh, it is a, it's a state that votes pretty close to the national average, but typically, to the extent it deviates from the national average, it's usually in a Republican direction. So I think of the 31 elections that we've had since 1896, Ohio's been more Republican than the nation in uh, 25 of them. Uh, and, and this this election was the, the most recent election was um, Ohio was more Republican than the significantly more Republican than the nation, uh, and it voted further from the national average than uh, than it had in any election since before the Great Depression. $181 million so far. That's one-fifth of the national total of $883 million, a figure that could top $1 billion by Election Day. In Columbus, more than 6,600 ads just this month. That's 333 a day. Candidates are spending so much time here, it's as if they're running for president of Ohio. A total of 30 days since Labor Day, 15 of them in October. Why Ohio? Voters here have picked the winner in every election since 1960, and no Republican has won the White House without it. The urban north, heavy with the auto industry, leans Democratic. The rural south, where mining is important, trends Republican. This could all come down to Ohio this year. It sure is looking like it. Political scientist Paul Beck of The Ohio State University says Ohio voters look like America. In terms of African Americans, in terms of small town people, Christian conservatives, liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans, they're, they're all here. Let's look at the election in 1948. President Harry Truman versus Thomas Dewey, the governor of New York. Truman was the vice president in 1944 when FDR beat Dewey, um, even though Dewey actually won the election in Ohio in 1944, and we'll talk about that later. That's one of the two of the 31 that Ohio has gotten incorrect. 
So in 1945, FDR dies. Truman takes over. And within weeks, the Nazis surrender. And in August, Truman makes the decision to drop two atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and World War II comes to an end. But Truman, from 1945 and those famous pictures you see in Times Square of sailors just kissing any girl they find, and that was VE Day, August 1945. What a day. Truman becomes wildly unpopular. The economy goes in the tank. The rise of the Soviet Union, the post-war era, immediately after the war, is not going the way the Americans want. We were the winners. We should be rich. We should have all our dreams come true. But there's such a transition from everybody coming out of the, of the war theaters back into the workforce. There's tremendous upheaval in those years leading up to the summer of 1948. And that's where we find Truman in Philadelphia in the summer of 1948. He's going to give a, probably the biggest speech of his life since the end of the war, his convention speech. The Democratic Party torn apart by the Dixiecrats. People are running from the party. People like Strom Thurmond over a civil rights platform. But Truman knows he's going to need every single Democratic vote he can get. And after all the bickering and the arguing and the walkouts, his speech is delayed. It doesn't go on until late, late at night. But Truman takes the stage down at least a dozen points to Dewey and begins his comeback right there on the stage in Philadelphia. Senator Barkley and I will win this election and make these Republicans like it. Don't you forget that. We'll do that because they're wrong and we're right. And I'll prove it to you in just a few minutes. Truman goes on the attack. He knows he's down. And on the convention floor, he decides, I'm going to put all of these failures, I'm going to put them on the Republican Congress. And he calls them the do-nothing Congress. And in a stroke of genius, he decides that he's going to call back Congress from their summer vacations at the end of the month. My duty as president requires that I use every means within my power to get the laws the people need on matters of such importance and urgency. I am therefore calling this Congress back into session on the 26th of July. It's a tactic we've seen by presidents ever since 1948. The do-nothing Congress. President Obama relied on it heavily in 2012 and even through his, his second term. Um, and, and a lot of times with good reason. But this tactic begins to turn the, turn the tide on the Republicans because the Republicans' idea and Dewey's appeal is that the country longs for these days before the New Deal in the unions and everything being different. It's, they want to go back to the way things were. And Thomas Dewey says he can shrink down government again. He can bring down taxes. We can go back to the way things were in the 20s before FDR, before the New Deal. And his message appeals to millions of Americans. He's a national figure. He's the governor of New York. He ran for president in 1944 against FDR, as we said. So people know Dewey, and people trust Dewey. He's scandal-free. He's done a great job with New York. He spent the 1930s busting gangsters and bootleggers. People know this guy, and they can trust this guy. And his message, a Republican conservative message, is really what the country wants. They've had FDR and the Democrats since 1932, 16 years, and they want to change. Tonight, we enter upon a campaign to unite all America. On January 20, we will enter on a new era. Next January 20, there will begin in Washington the biggest unraveling, unsnarling, untangling operation in our nation's history. So we sit down with Kyle, and we ask him, and we pour over this 1948 map, because I can tell you this, it comes down to Ohio for the election. The national election comes down to Ohio, and it's not decided on election night. It goes into the morning. So we look at this map, and we look and see how did Truman get so close in Ohio, 
And did, was it enough for him to pull it out? In terms of its uh, internal politics at this time, because uh, prior to the New Deal, the Democrats actually were strongest in some of the rural areas of the state. Uh, and the Republicans were sort of more of the the urban party, and that kind of that changed. It, it didn't change suddenly, but you can really see a lot of the changes happening uh, when the New Deal is implemented, and Franklin Roosevelt starts to get these huge margins amongst um, African Americans, who by this time had made up you know made up a, a small but significant voting block in Ohio, and also amongst. Uh, recent immigrants and the, the children of recent immigrants, um, who, you know, a lot of them from, you know, from various places in Europe, particularly um, the newer immigrants in uh, the 20th century so were from urban. East, Eastern Europe and basically people who were, who I guess what you would consider to be now kind of the white working class um, people who, who really felt that they were assisted a great deal by the programs of the New Deal addressing the Great Depression. At the same time, you had traditional cons kind of conservative Democrats in rural areas who really didn't like the New Deal and didn't really like Roosevelt. And so a lot of those places sort of shifted away. But so Truman's map in 48 is kind of this mishmash of he wins a lot of the immigrant heavy industrial areas in the eastern part of the state, including, you know, tra de Democratic Cuyahoga County, uh, the Mah the ca the, some of the counties of the Mahoning Valley, you know, Youngst Youngstown. Um, he wins Steubenville, which is Jefferson County, Belmont and Monroe Counties along the Ohio River, which, again, were also kind of immigrant-heavy places. There's a lot of mining there. Uh, so those places were, were Democratic really until the 2000s. But then he also wins a lot of um, a, a significant number of, of counties in the western part of the state uh, that are sort of more rural. There was a farm crisis in, 19, in, in uh, 1948, and uh, Truman successfully sort of pinned that on Republicans who had taken the um, on the Congress contr control of ha the House and Senate in 1946. Uh, you know, people who are familiar with that election may recall that Truman ran against the so-called Do Nothing Congress. Yep. Uh, and you know, he just he, he was able to sort of make a pitch to some of these folks that um, had recently been abandoning the Democratic Party and would abandon the Democratic Party going forward. Uh, but 1948 represented the last gasp of a sort of this ability for, for Democrats to maybe carry some of the you know, these sort of rural counties uh, in western Ohio. Uh, two of those are Mercer and Putnam, again, which are those very uh, two very Catholic counties uh, that would go and swing to, um, to Kennedy pretty significantly uh, in, in 1960 in that religiously uh, colored election. But, you know, a lot some of these places that... Um, that Truman carried in 48, you know, really would, would only vote Democratic, you know, maybe one or two more times up until now. Uh, you know, in, for instance, in 1964, when Lyndon Johnson carried, I think, 83, 88 counties in a landslide. Uh, but some many counties in Ohio haven't voted Democratic since that 1964 election. 83 out of 88 for a Democrat, that's got to be about a record, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I think it, I think that probably is. Um, and uh, you know Johnson won, wanted to blow out uh, everywhere. But you know that 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 uh, election in '64 sort of exposes the counties that really are the true bedrock Republican counties in Ohio. Uh, and the one I think that really stands out is Delaware County in Central Ohio, which is both the well now the wealthiest county in Ohio and also the fastest growing county. Uh, in Ohio, and it's actually one of the few places in the most recent election where uh, Hillary Clinton actually did a little bit better than Barack Obama, uh, because that election was that uh, Trump had some problems with um, you know college-educated Republicans, and so there was a little bit of erosion in Delaware County, uh, but obviously not nearly enough for for Clinton to win the state. Yeah, Truman wins, I believe, 22 counties in in 1948. Um, just you know, little. Currently, I think Obama wins 16 or 17 against Romney. Mm -hmm. um, what are your biggest, and, and, and just briefly, this is a giantly broad question, but what are some of the biggest shifts from the mid-20th mid century to today in Ohio's voting demographics? I feel maybe it's moved a little farther south. Um, what are those things from 48 to you know, the Trump and Obama elections recently? What, what are some of those changes that you've seen? I'd say that the, the biggest... One of the biggest developments over the past 50, 60 years, and really it's it sort of uh, come to a head within the last 20, but that uh, Franklin and Hamilton counties, Columbus, Cincinnati, were traditionally voted more Republican than the state. And uh, Franklin County voted for Clinton in 96. Hamilton County voted for Obama in uh, 2008. And those counties have continued to just trend more and more Democratic. The flip side of that, and this was really accentuated in the 2016 election, 
is that Democrats actually used to do fairly well in Southeast Ohio, um, places like uh, Steubenville, certainly Athens, where Ohio University is, was still a, a, a solidly Democratic uh, county, thanks in large part to the uh, to the college. Uh, but then also, uh, uh, you know, you, you've seen some Democratic erosion more recently in in the Youngstown area. Um, but so so the changes have essentially been that the two you know two big urban counties, Franklin and Hamilton, have joined with Cuyahoga, sort of this Democratic block. But uh, Republicans have sort of grown in strength, particularly in uh, Appalachian, Ohio, in the eastern part of the state. Uh, and until recently, you know, Obama was able to uh, make up for his losses in the eastern part of the state, particularly in the southeast Ohio, by getting those big margins in the urban counties. Uh, but Hillary Clinton was able to get those big margins in the urban counties, but basically the rest of the state shifted against her. Sure. And... You know, Athens is always that little blue dot that you see in Southeast Ohio. Anytime you're watching John King or somebody on CNN, mm. uh, you, well, you had a name for it. What's the uh, the People's Republic of Athens? That's it. Yeah, the yeah that's my my old motto. But you know, until until pretty recently, uh, Jefferson, Belmont, and Monroe on the uh, on the Ohio River, uh, those counties were were pretty pretty democratic, uh, and but but they've they've trended away uh, in in recent years, uh, just like. Really, a lot of Appalachia, and I'd say the state of West Virginia, which is the only state that is a 100% Appalachian, is defined by the, the federal government. You know, as recently as 1988, West Virginia was voting for Michael Dukakis. Now, uh, Donald Trump's uh, margin of victory there was the second largest in, in the country. Uh, so West Virginia is a state that sort of really moved to the Republicans, and in similar kinds of counties in, in, in Ohio, we've seen similar kinds of changes, particularly recently. You, uh, we talk about... You know, and you talk about in your book how uh, Cook County in Illinois is, what, 40% approximately of the right. electorate. Um, what is the Columbus, Cleveland, uh, Cincinnati? How, what is the percentage of that for the Ohio electorate? So the uh, um, Cuyahoga, Franklin, and Hamilton combined cast about 30% of all 30%. votes in Ohio. And yeah, just to put it in perspective, uh, Cook County, which is Chicago, cast about 40% of all the Illinois votes. In, uh, in 2012, if you had just taken, if you'd taken Cook out of Illinois and Cuyahoga, Franklin, Hamilton out of Ohio, uh, Mitt Romney would have won the rest of those states by roughly about five points. So the states were pretty similar. Um, in this most recent election, uh, Trump did significantly better outside of the big cities in Ohio than he did in Illinois. Um, so that dynamic sort of changed a little bit. But you know, the reason why Illinois is so democratic and Ohio is you know, a, sort of a bellwether state, potentially trending Republican, uh, is that if you put those three big urban counties together in Ohio, uh, I, I think that Clinton got 61 or 62 percent combined in those counties. Uh, in Cook, uh, Clinton got something like 75 or 76 percent. And the same with Obama. Yeah, and same with Obama. So uh, our our three our three big urban counties combined, a don't cast as big of a share of the vote as some of these big cities do in other states like New York City also, um, and uh, they're just not as democratic combined. Truman wins. We remember that iconic picture of him the next day holding up the Chicago paper. It says Dewey defeats Truman. They had printed the paper thinking Dewey would win. The country thought Dewey would win going into Election Day. But Truman wins at 11 in the morning. The results in Ohio come in and Dewey is convinced that he cannot top the electoral votes needed. And Ohio has beaten the Electoral College and has elected Truman in an upset. Dewey's conceding. And, uh, Ohio was the payoff. Ohio that's, was the payoff. Oh, well, let's, let, let's read that. I think that's good. If that's the one that uh, precipitated that statement, then uh, Ohio, 9,560 polling places out of 9,710. Truman, 1,435,095. Dewey, 1,421,345. There, ladies and gentlemen, is the information we're informed. Which, upon reaching Governor Dewey, caused him to concede.
going to go forward here to the 1976 election. President Ford of Michigan taking on the up-and-coming uh, governor of Georgia, Jimmy Carter. This is one of my favorite elections. I wasn't born yet, um, but I find it so fascinating how few people realize just how close this election was and how Ohio played such a pivotal role in the final days as Ford tries to make his comeback. President Ford reached the presidency, reached the Oval Office, much like President Truman did, but President Ford was never even elected. He'd never won a national election. Truman at least had been the vice president in 44 before FDR died. Ford reaches office after Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigns. And following the, uh, the resignation of his own president, President Nixon, in August of 1974. Ford takes office on August 9th, 1974. And after the swearing in, he speaks to the nation. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here, the people rule. But any goodwill that the country is feeling towards President Ford slips away a month later under pressure, growing pressure, that President Nixon will be prosecuted and he will surely be found guilty for crimes against this nation, crimes he committed as president. Seeing the government and the presidency itself in jeopardy, Ford makes a courageous decision, a decision that probably loses him the election in 1976, but he decides to grant President Nixon a full, unconditional pardon for his actions during Watergate. A full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon for all offenses against the United States which he, Richard Nixon, has committed or may have committed or taken part in during the period from July 20, 1969 through August 9, 1974. The left goes nuts. Democrats go nuts. Hell, the middle goes nuts. Republicans go nuts. People were fed up with Nixon. And Ford uses maybe the most controversial presidential pardon of all time, a president pardoning another president who left the office in disgrace. Ford plummets in the polls. He says he doesn't care. He'd rather be right than win the election. 1976 rolls around. An up-and-coming former governor of California, a staunch conservative, Ronald Reagan, decides to run in the primary against a sitting president, something we hadn't seen in years. And Reagan is all the way up until the convention, battling Ford state for state, but Ford has the delegates. And when we get to the convention, he picks Bob Dole as his running mate, the Kansas senator, and the delegates put him over the top, even though people were watching on the convention floor, nearly half the delegates voting for voting for Reagan, yelling for Reagan. Ford brings Reagan up on stage, and Reagan gives an amazing speech about, about the two superpowers in the world and how we have to keep our children safe, a speech that really catapulted him uh, to, to the presidency in 1980, uh, made him seem like less of a cowboy and more of that you know, conservative, caring conservative that he, that he probably really was. Anyways, in 76, the Democratic side, they've got a pretty good shot here. The idea is that anyone they nominate is going to be strong enough to win this presidency. The Republican, two years earlier, two years and two months before the election, two years and three months, resigns. The vice president had resigned before that in scandal. The Democrats have an easy road, but they don't have the candidate. And they go through the primary in an unknown Jimmy Carter, a peanut farmer out of, this, out of Georgia, Plains, Georgia, rises to the top. I want you to listen closely because I mean it. I'll never tell a lie. I'll never make a misleading statement. I'll never betray the confidence that any of you has in me. And I will never avoid a controversial issue. I won't be any better president than I am a candidate. Watch the television, listen to the radio. If you ever see me do any of those things, don't support me. 
because I would not be worthy to be the president of this country. But I don't intend to do any of those things because my faith and my confidence and my support and my criticism and my advice comes from people like you who don't want anything selfish out of government and want to see us once again have a nation that's as good and honest and decent and truthful and competent and compassionate and is filled with love as are the American people. Carter enters 1976 after the conventions with a huge lead. He runs on trust. People are sick of Watergate and Nixon, and Ford's just seen as an extension of that. But as the campaign gets underway in the fall, Ford begins out campaigning Carter, the newbie. Carter, he does, he's making conflicting statements. He's wishy-washy. Ford has got the power of the presidency behind him, and he's out on the stump making speech after speech, and he's gaining ground in the polls. The first debate, he looks good. Carter seems disorganized. The second debate, President Ford gets an easy question about Soviet domination in Eastern Europe, and he blows it. There is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, and there never will be under a Ford administration. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, could I just follow? Did I understand you to say, sir, that the Russians are not using Eastern Europe as their own sphere of influence and occupying mo most of the countries there and, and, and making sure with their troops that it's, a, that it's a communist zone, whereas on our side of the line, the Italians and the French are still flirting with I don't believe, uh, Mr. Frankel, even with that giant mistake in front of the entire country on TV, Ford still, he rebounds. Carter makes his own gaffes. He's inexperienced. He gives an interview to Playboy magazine where he says he has lust in his heart. He's looked at other women, and he's lusted after them. And he's supposed to be this trustworthy religious figure that we can all look up to that's going to clean everything up, the moral candidate. And Carter's lead again begins to chip away. When he's in California, he sounds like Cesar Chavez. When he's in Chicago, he sounds like Mayor Daly. When he's in New York, he sounds like Ralph Nader. When he's in Washington, D.C., he sounds like my good friend George Meany. He wanders, he wavers, he waffles, and he wiggles. He isn't the man you want for President of the United States. And so October goes, and into November of 1976, and Ford is gaining. He's still down, but he's confident. And he's leaving. He's going through Pennsylvania, through Northeast Ohio, all the way across the Turnpike to go back to his home state of Michigan on the final day, the Monday before the election. His campaign manager set up a couple of stops. Cleveland, Sandusky, Toledo, as he, as he makes his way back to, to Michigan. And he decides that the hay's in the barn. He decides that he's done. He's done everything he can to become president. And he calls off a couple of late night stops, a couple of late night rallies that were planned earlier in the day in Ohio. Will that come back to haunt him? We asked Kyle Condict about 1976 election, one of the closest in the country, and how Ohio made the difference for the Electoral College. This election was decided by 0.27 is my count, um, about 11,000 votes, um, almost as close as the one before. Obviously, we're getting a little bit larger vote count in 76 compared to 48, but incredibly tight. And I don't feel like a lot of our listeners or a lot of people, certainly millennials, Gen X people who didn't see or, or watch this election, they don't realize how damn close Gerald Ford was to winning that election. Yeah, and... and you know, there's, that was another election that would have been a pretty big upset if Ford had actually won because Carter sort of seemed like the favorite the whole time, although, uh, you know, there were these polls showing him up by, you know, insane margins throughout the summertime, and I think the Carter people were cognizant that those were sort of, that was sort of a mirage, but the, but the race closed uh, throughout the fall uh, and ended up being super close across the country, uh, including in Ohio. Uh, what I think won Ohio for Carter in 76 was, I think he really had a good profile for Southeast Ohio, 
Uh, he's a you know white evangelical Christian. Uh, he's a Southerner, and there's sort of a Southern flavor to that part of the state. Uh, it's a it's evangelical heavy compared to the rest of uh, compared to the rest of the state. And so uh, uh, Carter won a number of counties in Southeast Ohio that Democrats typically typically don't win, and these aren't places with huge populations. But uh, in an election that was so close, uh, you know, Carter won Southeast Ohio by almost ten points, which is a which is a pretty good uh, margin for a for a Democrat. Or Carter, I'm sorry, won won Southeast Ohio by about ten points, which is a really good margin for a Democrat uh, in that uh, in that part of the state. Uh, and also, you know, Carter did uh, acceptably well in Northeast Ohio. Uh, you know, winning a lot of the traditional Democratic uh, strongholds uh, in that part of the the state, uh, and it was able to uh, to hold off uh, Ford despite Ford winning, uh, you know, Franklin and Hamilton and the western part of the state by pretty big numbers. Yeah, I mean, you look at this the electoral map here that we're looking at, and if you he really puts a ring once you get east of San, uh, Cincinnati. I mean, all the way, all those river towns, kills it in southeast Ohio. Does very well all the way along the border, the eastern border, Belmont, uh, Mahoning, Columbiana, um, and then obviously all the way uh, all the way along the lake, almost to Toledo. Um, so he that's where he really did well. He wins Dayton, Montgomery too, or not? Yes. Um, so you know that election, um, it comes down. It's a two ninety seven to two forty is the final electoral count there. Ohio still in seventy six has twenty five electoral votes. Um, there's people said, you know, he, if Ford had had, a, you know, another week, that election's held on November 2nd. Um, you know, if it's held on the 9th or something, there's some people out there who believe Ford could have won that. Um, yeah, Wisconsin was also very close that year. Wisconsin was actually the, the decisive state, but, but you know, if, if Ford had won Wisconsin and, and Ohio, he would have won the election. So right. uh, that was another one, just like 48, that really came down to, to just a, a few states that were very, very close. And, you know, you look at uh, the razor-thin margins there. If he could have flipped, he loses by 11,000. So he flips 5,500 votes in Ohio. He gets 25 there. If he flips 3,000 votes in Hawaii... Uh, he gets four points there. It's a four, which I don't think it has that many electoral votes now. There's four electoral votes. Still Hawaii four. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he flips those, 5,500 5, in Ohio, 3,000 in Hawaii. He makes up that difference in the Electoral College, I think, wins um, by one point in that, in that scenario. Or go, it actually might have gone to the House at that point. I think they would have both been under 270. Um, but there's this story, you know, Ford's campaign manager, um, the last day of the election, Monday, Ford is he's traveling – West, and he has to go through Northeast Ohio in the afternoon. He lives in Michigan, Western Michigan, Kalamazoo, maybe, mm -hmm. um, or Grand Rapids, I can't remember. Um, and he goes through Ohio and calls off an event in Cleveland and a final nighttime event on that Monday in Toledo. And uh, I just wondered if you ever heard that story. His campaign manager always regretted not making those stops instead of just going home and saying, hey, the hay's in the barn. Uh, we did the best we could. Let's, let's rest up Monday night and, and see what the results are. Um, 5,500 votes. Again, it's you know, we can't say whether that would have been the difference, but that's how close 76 really was. Yeah, and you never know if, you know, he had the events, maybe there's a different outcome. I, you know, it's, again, it's impossible to know. Right. One, one thing that also I think is important to note in the 76 election that I know the Ford campaign uh, was very cognizant of, which was, which was that during one of the debates, Ford made this sort of infamous gaffe about uh, saying that, claiming that there was like no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe. Uh, and he, he basically just sort of flubbed what he wanted to say. But, uh, you know, this is a time where there's still pretty strong bonds with sort of ethnic communities, particularly, at, you know, like Northeast Ohio. Uh, but also I think, you know, Wisconsin was important in that election, places like Milwaukee, uh, where, you, again, you have a lot of, you know, ethnic voters who are very cognizant of maybe even relatives back home in, you know, Poland or Czechoslovakia or wherever. Uh, and given the very close margins in those states, you wonder if hmm. uh, he upset a small number of, uh, you know, sort of quote, you know, ethnic kinds of voters uh, with with that, and, and that that might have also been the difference between winning and losing. I mean, when when an election is so close, there are all sorts of things that you could say were you know determine the outcome or contributed to it. Yeah, we play that clip in the episode. And I mean, the moderator gives him a chance to to change his answer, and he doubles down. There is no. Domination, you know, the Soviet applies. Yeah. It was, uh, you, Carter's face is just priceless. He's just so happy. He's giddy yeah. over, what, over what the president said. Ford loses. He loses Ohio by 5,500 votes. Were those stops in northern Ohio, could they have been the difference on the day before the election? He loses Hawaii by 7,000 votes. He loses the election 
by a total of 12,000 votes. Hawaii, four points. Ohio, 25 points. It would have got him to 269, could have thrown it into the house. Wisconsin and Ohio. Wisconsin was the final state that comes down. Also could have given it to him with Ohio. 5,500 votes in Ohio, and Carter wins. And Carter wins the Electoral College, 297 to 240. Yes, I do. In the state of Hawaii, with four electoral votes, those votes have gone to Carter, and that does it. ABC now projects Carter is the winner with 272 electoral votes. We had wondered which one of us was going to make this announcement. It was the one who got the last projection, and it's the four Hawaii votes that, on our account, has put Carter over the top by our projection. James Earl Carter, the next president of the United States. And that brings us to the 2004 election. George W. Bush running for re-election against Massachusetts Senator John Kerry. I don't need to go into a big, long diatribe about the 2004 election and the conditions surrounding it. It was only 13 years ago. The vast majority of people listening to this show voted in that election or at least lived through it. You really started to notice the divide in this country. It it was a nasty campaign. Um, We've obviously seen nastier uh, in recent years, but... There was a lot of mud throwing in 2004 between both parties, on both sides. Um, George Bush with the Swift Boat campaign, uh, calling into question Kerry's military service in Vietnam. Um, All kinds of issues back and forth between those two campaigns. We're going to build alliances. We're not going to go unilaterally. We're not going to go alone like this president did. Mr. President, let's extend for a minute. Let me just one question. I've got to answer this. Well, I mean, I, exactly. And with reservists being held on duty. But let me answer this, what he just said about Well, going I wanted to alone. get into the issue you of the You tell Tony draft. Blair we're going alone. Tell Tony Blair we're going alone. Tell Servio Berlusconi we're going alone. Tell Alexander Kwasniewski of Poland we're going alone. We've got 30 countries there. It denigrates an alliance to say we're going alone to discount their sacrifices. You cannot lead an alliance if you say, you know, you're going alone. And people listen. They're sacrificing with us. Senator. Mr. President, countries are leaving the coalition, not joining. Eight countries have left it. If Missouri, just given the number of people from Missouri are in the military over there today, were a country, It would be the third largest country in the coalition behind Great Britain and the United States. That's not a grand coalition. Ninety percent of the casualties are American. Ninety percent of the costs are coming out of your pockets. I could do a better job. My plan does a better job. And that's why I'll be a better commander in chief. The country was on edge. You know, Gore had lost by 600 votes and it went to the Supreme Court four years earlier. And... That election night had a lot of the same feelings. It felt like deja vu that Ohio was too close to call. The networks won't call it. This network called it. They pulled it back. Um, The Kerry campaign does not give in, even though they're down by well over 100,000 votes late that night. Um, They go into the morning. They look at the situation again in the morning and and decide that there's no path to victory for them. Ohio falls to Bush's side. It puts him over 270 and he is re-elected president in those two campaigns. But why we want to look at 2004 here is that's the election that Ohio really was the difference maker. So we sat down with Kyle Kondik to ask him about 2004. 2004 election. Ohio is being noticed, um, you know, as this, as this swing state or this bellwether state, um, and the election is going to be close. I mean, Bush is, at this point, we know there's no WMDs, um, Bush is sliding. Um, he's made his own gas in the election. Kerry, not an incredibly strong candidate, but is making a solid push. Um, and the election night, you know, we're fresh off of 2000 with the Bush-Gore recount situation. Um, and the country knows it's going to be another close election. Bush wins Ohio 
Um, and really the reason people remember that election so much here in the Buckeye State is most of the major news organizations called that election basically for President Bush when, when they called Ohio. It, the map at that point did not really work out for Kerry. Um, so people, you know, Kerry doesn't concede until the morning, but I went to bed that night. I remember around 3 or 4 in the morning that once they called Ohio, I felt, well, that's going to do it. I'll wake up in the morning and see if anything's changed. Um, can you talk about just a little bit about 2004? First of all, the gap is 118,000, which, again, there's more votes. It's still a very small, very close vote. Um, but this idea, you know, there's some things that this spread was a little bigger than people realize, but there's also some conspiracy talk around that election. Um, and it's, a, it's a, just a popular election to discuss here in the Buckeye State. Yeah, uh, so uh, 2004 is interesting in that it's one of the one of the times where uh, Ohio really was the so-called you know tipping point state in the election. You know, that it was it was the state that put if you put all the states in order in terms of their margin, it was the state that was that really put Bush over 270. If Ohio had voted for John Kerry, John Kerry would have won. Uh, so it really did determine the election. Uh, 2004 also was one of the few times that Ohio Ohio uh, Kerry actually did slightly better in Ohio than he did nationally. Uh, in terms of the margin, which typically Republicans do a little bit better in Ohio than they do um, nationally. And um, I think both campaigns perform really well in Ohio. I think that uh, the Democrats really got out their vote in, uh, in, in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio and then also in Franklin County, which by this point is transitioning to becoming a solidly Democratic county. You've got good Democratic margins in Lucas County, which is where Toledo is. Uh, and Democrats still, at that point, retain some of the traditional Democratic counties in the eastern part of the state, particularly in, in, in southeast Ohio. Uh, but Carl Rove and the Bush campaign are able to squeeze really big margins out of the core uh, Republican counties and out of the suburbs and out of the uh, exurban counties uh, and able to win the state by two points. The, the conspiracy theories about the election, one is more one is less credible than the other. The one that's not very credible is this idea that the voting machines were somehow rigged or something like that, or that um, there's, this, there's this thing in vogue among certain, I, I think would say activists on the left in particular, saying that, oh, well, the, the exit polls suggested that actually Kerry was going to win Ohio, and then they were reweighted. And, you know, exit polls are not nearly as good of a metric as actual vote totals, <laughs> so I would go with the vote mm. totals uh, instead. And then also there's this idea that in that year there was a uh, constitutional amendment on the ballot to uh, ban same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage was already banned in Ohio at that time. Of course, we've had this massive sea change uh, in public opinion on same-sex marriage over the last decade. That but was issue one, I issue, think. Yeah, but, but that issue passed quite, uh, quite significantly, and there was this thought that um, it really it brought out extra voters for Bush. Uh, I don't... I don't think that that helped. I don't think that that really uh, determined the state. And there's some academic research that sort of uh, backs up that assertion. Although there are a lot of people I respect who also uh, do think that 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 issue was was really important in Ohio. But what what I think it, you sort of have to look at though is that was Ohio, given its history, really going to vote? against an incumbent Republican president when that incumbent Republican president was winning the national popular vote. Because, as I've said, Ohio's typically more Republican than the nation. It wasn't in this election, but it, but it was very close to the national average. Uh, it, would, it wouldn't have made much sense, historically speaking, for Ohio to vote for Kerry and put, give him the presidency when Kerry was losing a national popular vote. Uh, so oh, how Ohio performed in 2004 makes perfect sense to me. And I don't think that that, I don't think that there's really any conspiracy that jumps out uh, as being credible when you look at the actual results. Well, and you look at, uh, you know, he's described as a boogeyman in your book, but there's a lot of people who had issues with our Secretary of State at that time, Kenneth Blackwell. We had long lines at the election places. Again, do, do long lines affect Republicans or Democrats? That's, we could, sure, yeah. We could talk about that all day. But there's a great quote from your old mentor, is it uh, Tom, how do you say the last name, Suds? Tom Suttis. Yeah, Tom Suttis, a plain dealer columnist who writes about Blackwell, and, you, and I quote in your book, rigging Ohio for Bush would have required energy and skill from a secretary of state who had neither. <laughs> I love that quote. And also, Ohio elections are run largely at the county level. I mean, the secretary of state does intercede in certain points, but... 
uh, you know, it, it would just it would just be really hard to to rig an election statewide. I think in Ohio, really, in, in any other place, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be some shenanigans here and there. But you know, Bush did win the state by about 120,000 votes. That's not that that's close, but it's not you know it's not super duper close. Um, so again, the way that the way that Ohio voted in 2004 made sense. There doesn't there doesn't seem to be any um, real evidence of sort of foul play in that election, as far as I could tell. So Bush hangs on. It goes through the night, nothing like we had in 2000, but the election is basically determined. The next morning, Kerry comes out to his fans in Boston, his supporters, and concedes the race. I would not give up this fight if there was a chance that we would prevail. But it is now clear that even when all the provisional ballots are counted, which they will be, there won't be enough outstanding votes for us to be able to win Ohio. And therefore, we cannot win this election. There you have it. Kerry loses Ohio, so Kerry loses the election. George Bush goes on to win re-election thanks to the Buckeye State. So we talk about this 29-2 and two record that we have, but we also want to talk to Kyle, well, what happened in those two that we lost? Uh, and when I say lost, I mean Ohio did not pick the winner in 1944 and 1960. So we asked Kyle, what's keeping Ohio from picking the winners in those two years? We lost, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're 1944 and mm-hmm. 1960. When I say lost, I mean we did not, Ohio did not pick the winning candidate that year. Right. So and let's talk about 44. So uh, one of the big factors in 1944 was that uh, that was Franklin Roosevelt's last election. Roosevelt won fairly comfortably, but it was the, the weakest of his four uh, uh, victories, although he was not that close, not very close to losing. Uh, the Republican candidate that year was Thomas Dewey, the governor of New York, who, of course, would, would be sort of a more famous candidate in 1948 when he uh, lost in, in what is you know, described as one of the biggest upsets in American political history to Harry Truman in 1948. But Dewey was the candidate also in 44, and his running mate was John W. Bricker, who was the governor, Republican governor of Ohio. And there is some academic research that suggests that um, vice presidential candidates can be worth something like two to three points mm-hmm. uh, in their home state. Uh, and the, um, the uh, Dewey Bricker ticket won Ohio by, uh, I think it was four tenths of a percentage point. Yeah, it's very close. So, um, you know, I think you could make the argument that if Bricker had been on a ticket, Roosevelt probably would have narrowly carried the state. And there are some other factors. Um, FDR's win was probably a little weaker than it should have been because it was harder for service members who were many, you know, millions of people deployed and, and you know, or or, or uh, supporting the military overseas. It was uh, it was kind of hard for a lot of them to vote, and I think that probably depressed FDR's uh, support a little bit uh, in states all over the country, including uh, including Ohio. So that's another factor. But I think the, the Bricker being on the ticket. Uh, was the most notable, and Bricker is the last Ohioan to be on a uh, major national ticket, which is amazing. Ohio Ohio produced all these presidents um, from 1840 to 1920, and then had Bricker on the ticket in 44, but uh, haven't had anyone since. And of course, you know, John Kasich tried to run for president in 2016, really outside of winning the Ohio primary, didn't really do all that much. Um, but you know, for a state that's been so important in presidential elections. Uh, we haven't really had a major national yeah, we're, figure. We're for on a, time. we're on a little bit of a cold streak. Here. Yeah, that's right. Um, and sh- you know, you look at how many presidents we had, especially from Hayes uh, until 1912 with Taft, or I should say 1920 with Harding. Mm-hmm. Um, it is amazing we haven't even had someone on the ticket, uh, especially for such a swing state. Um, so the Bricker, yeah, the Bricker factor is huge. Um, you know, Br- there's a Bricker and Eckler firm here. Actually, my yep. mother used to work at Bricker and Eckler. Sure. Uh, I still have a cousin who works there. So that was his firm downtown. Well, the other one we lost is 1960. So now that is obviously known as a very close national election. Um, it's one of the first real what we consider modern elections where you got television playing a role. Sure. But Ohio goes for Nixon by about 270,000 votes in a year that we actually had a very high turnout. Um, that was not that much. But what was it about 60? It's not quite as clear. You know, there's no Ohio- Ohioans on the ticket. What did you see in the 1960 election that kind of swung it for Nixon, um, who was the favorite going into Election Day? There's this great uh, quote um, that uh, John F. Kennedy said after the election when he said he said that uh, nowhere do I get uh, 
more more applause and fewer votes than Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> and actually, you know, back then, uh, Columbus, Cincinnati were totally Republican places. But that was an interesting election because it was an election that really you see re religious voting patterns. You know, it's basically Catholics versus Protestants. Uh, according, I think, to Gallup, uh, Kennedy won about four out of every five Catholics, and Nixon won three of every five Protestants. Wow. Uh, and you could see this in Ohio's voting pattern. In fact, uh, if you look at the... Because the, uh, the, the election before that, 1956, Eisenhower's re-election over Adlai Stevenson was basically a blowout election. So if you look at the, the change in the vote from 56 to 60 in Ohio and nationally, basically in places that had a lot of Catholics you see Kennedy doing way better than Stevenson did in 56, but in places that were heavily Protestant, you don't really see much change at all. So in Ohio, there are two counties in the north north uh, western part of the state, uh, Mercer and Putnam County, small rural counties, they're actually super-duper Republican now. Mercer's um, a very Catholic county, right? Well, yeah, both yeah. both Mercer and Putnam are the only two counties in the, in the state that are majority Catholic. Okay. And nowhere did Kennedy improve more on 1956 on Adelaide. Stevenson than in Mercer and Putnam counties. Uh, I think he still lost. I think he still lost both of them. But it was you know he went from gained like 17 points or something on on well, Stevenson. Yeah, I mean, and, and you and you saw that in other places that were heavily Catholic in the state. Um, uh, but like Franklin County, for instance, which really isn't as Catholic as, as some other places, doesn't have a, didn't really have a big influx of a lot of uh, Eastern European, Italian immigrants, maybe, you know, 100, 120 years ago. Um, Franklin County was, you know, Republican most all the time anyway, but really it was very cool to Kennedy, whereas Kennedy did okay at Hamilton County. Cincinnati has more Catholics, and of course Cuyahoga County too. Uh, which has a significant number of Catholics, but you look at you look at like Lake County, which is part of the you know the Cleveland suburban exurban area. That's another county that's pretty heavily Catholic. Um, Kennedy actually carried Lake County, even though it was and still is kind of a Republican leaning swing county. But so basically, to, to, to sum it up, there weren't enough Catholics in Ohio to elect <laughs> to elect Kennedy in in 1960. Well, I love that that, you, and I never heard that quote before. Uh, you know, I was watching some of your stuff. Listen to some of the things that from from your book tour and that book that Kennedy quote about Columbus is great. I've never gotten a louder applause and less votes. <laughs> is that basically it? Yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, of course nowadays, uh, actually, uh, sometime soon within maybe the next two or three presidential elections, Franklin County is going to start casting the most votes in the state in presidential elections. Uh, it's gaining on Cuyahoga County in that in that regard, and it's either the the counties are about equal in population, or maybe Franklin has even overtaken it at this point. Uh, but Franklin has now become a you know super duper Democratic county, um, and and actually Hamilton's headed in that way too. Uh, so the three big urban counties are very Democratic, are getting there, um, but uh, you know the rest of the state is arguably moving Republican nowadays. That's going to do it for this week. Um, thanks so much to Kyle. Now let's get to this week's book recommendation. From Garfield's tomb to the serpent mound, from the big cities to the river towns, first in flight making history, there's so many books you need to see, I like reading, and I like reading. Tippecanoe and Tyler too From the Queen City to Lake Erie Blue Edison and a man on the moon So many books, which will we choose? I like reading I like reading As you probably guessed, our book recommendation for this week is the Bellwether, Why Ohio Picks the President by Kyle Kondik, uh, an Ohio University Press book, 2016. Check Kyle out on the uh, Virginia Center for Politics website. He does He's the managing editor every week of their Crystal Ball, um, it's a political newsletter, looking ahead to the week um, in the world of politics in D.C. So we really appreciate Kyle coming on. Go check his book out. Get it on Amazon. Um, it's available at most uh Retailers, so it, it is a really fun book to read if you're into Ohio presidential politics and just Ohio politics in general. Join us next week when we talk about 
Prohibition, Ohio versus Booze. Uh, check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Instagram, Ohio V the World Podcast. Check out our website, Ohio V the World Podcast.com. Thanks to the opening music from my favorite band, Forest of the Evergreens. We'll see you next week.